Uh, I want to introduce to you the, the person who will be moderating this session, uh, Dr. Shibli Telhami. He is the Anwar Sadat Professor for Peace and Development at the University of Maryland College Park and a non-resident senior fellow at the Saban Center at the Brookings Institution. He is a, a renowned uh, pollster on, in the Arab world, and he um, is, is frequently publishing on polls uh, regarding the Middle East and uh, Arab uh, public opinion in a variety of uh, media outlets. Uh, his most recent book, which I have a copy of here in my hand, The World Through the Arab Eyes, Arab, Arab Public Opinion and the Reshaping of the Middle East, is a long-term analysis uh, reflecting on uh, the polls that uh, Dr. Uh, Telhami has run uh, annually, um, but also sort of providing perspective on what that means, uh, how we should understand Arab uh, views of, of changes in taking place in the region and long-term trends. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Telhami to in introduce the uh, panelists and, and frame the discussion. Thanks very much. And just, I, I also didn't introduce myself, I realize. I'm Leila Halal, Director of the Middle East Task Force here at New America. Well, thanks very much, Leila. It's always a pleasure to be here, and it's really a pleasure for me to moderate this panel. Um, I think we're all fascinated with what's happening in Iran, and obviously uh, the election of uh, Hassan Rouhani really surprised um, all of us. Uh, it seemed to come out of nowhere, and so there's so much interest in finding out, A, how did it happen, and B, what it means uh, for Iran internally and for Iranian foreign policy. Uh, and so we have some fresh information. Uh, we have a, a particularly uh, unique scholar um, presenting some um, uh, polling data that has been done at, by the university, by Tehran University from uh, the beginning of May uh, all the way until late June um, after um, uh, the election of Rouhani. And uh, so he has a lot of information to share with us. Uh, uh, he is Ibrahim Mohsini, who is um, from Tehran University. He's a lecturer there uh, and also at the, the polling uh, center at the university. But uh, more importantly for us, he's also a PhD candidate at the University of Maryland, the School of Public Policy. Uh, who, uh, he's uh, done a lot of work there, and his dissertation uh, incorporated uh, polling data uh, as well. And um, he also worked uh, at the uh, program on international uh, public attitudes and, and uh, with its director, Stephen Cull, who's one of the discussant uh, for many years. And so therefore, he's acquired a lot of uh, uh, polling experience uh, through his role there, which wasn't just focused on Iran, but really a global and regional uh, polling uh, data. So it is really a pleasure uh, to have Ibrahim Mohsini uh, uh, present his, his data and his analysis of the data uh, for us. We're all interested. Um, to, um, for a discussion, uh, we have uh, two truly experienced uh, scholars. Um, uh, the first is Steve Call, my colleague and friend. Uh, Dr. Call is the director of the uh, program on uh, uh, international policy attitudes um, and also a uh, scholar at the School of Public Policy um, uh, at the University of Maryland. Uh, those of you, I, he doesn't really need any introduction, and most of you uh, have uh, read a lot of what he's been doing. He's been doing uh, polling uh, in the Middle East, in Islamic countries, globally, American public opinion toward the Middle East for many years, published a lot. Um, uh, but I want to particularly mention a, a relevant book, an excellent book that uh, was published by the Brookings Institution a couple of years ago, Feeling Betrayed, the Roots of Muslim Anger uh, at America. This is based on uh, a lot of uh, public uh, opinion polls in Muslim countries um, over a long period of time and, and very perceptive analysis uh, of, uh, of those attitudes. Uh, and finally, um, uh, Dr. Trita Parsi. Uh, again, uh, I think when you mention the Iranian discourse in this country, it's impossible not to mention Trita Parsi. He's one of the most prolific and thoughtful commentators on Iranian politics. He is the founder and president of the National Iranian American Council. Um, but he really is uh, coming out and, and often writes as a scholar. Certainly he's an advocate in that capacity. 
uh, but uh, he um, um, uh, received his uh, PhD from uh, from SAIS. He has written um, uh, some fabulous works, including um, two prominent books, uh, A Treacherous Alliance, The Secret Dealings of Iran, Israel, and the United States, which came out in 2007. But more recently, last year, he published a a, uh, an influential book on, on Iran policy called The Single Roll of the Dice, Obama's Diplomacy with Iran, which was published by Yale University Press in 2012. So we have really a terrific panel. Uh, we'll look forward to the presentation, and I invite uh, Ibrahim to come and uh, give the presentation, hopefully uh, about 20 or 30 minutes. Okay, so the topic we're going to talk about is the is Iran's uh, latest presidential election and its domestic and international ramifications. And the questions we want to address is, how did Rouhani win the 11th presidential election? Who voted for Rouhani and why? And what do Iranians expect Rouhani to do domestically, internationally? And I think uh, the topic of most interest is the the nuclear issue. To address these questions, I'm going to be using uh, 13 cross-sectional national probability sample surveys that were conducted between May 10th to 2000, I'm sorry, uh, to June 23rd. We did one panel uh, basically going back after the election, asking the people, the same people we had interviewed, asking the same kind of question to see how they maneuvered. And uh, we use the computer assist, assisted telephone interviewing method and uh, you know, calling uh, fixed landlines. The margin of error of these polls basically ranged from 2.2% to 3.7%. Uh, uh, so the first part, how did Rouhani win? In fact, Rouhani's surge began after the third debate. And I'm going to explain exactly what happened. Uh, in that debate and how that affected public opinion, which eventually led uh, to Rouhani's election. But uh, Khalibov was the front runner until two days before the election. Uh, and the general belief among the public was that this was going to go into the second round, with Khalibov being the fixed candidate and someone basically uh, competing with Khalibov for presidency uh, into the second round. When you look at these, um, this, does this have a pointer? Yes? No, what's happening? Is there? Okay, no pointer. So basically what you see here are the numbers we had until June uh, 13. And then we projected based on the, you gonna show me the? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Ah, this, which one? Oh, on top. Okay. So what we see, what the numbers we have, these are the numbers starting from May 9th. These are, each of them are uh, cross-sectional polls uh, uh, that, that, uh, that I talked about, all the way to June 13th, the night before the election. And based on the numbers we had, the trajectory based on the economic model that we had, we were putting uh, Rouhani around 46%. That was our prediction. But then after the election, one thing we realized was that perhaps this 32, since this 32 is the average of all of the interviews that was collected throughout the day. So we thought that maybe there is a time differentiation as well. And this average does not correctly represent the status of public opinion at the night of uh, June 13th. And that was exactly the case. When we looked at, when we divided up the June 13th uh, poll by time, and we had morning, noon, afternoon, and evening, the numbers were going from 26 to 28 to 32 to 38%. So had we used 38% instead of the, um, had we used 38% instead of the 32%, the mathematical calculation with the, I mean, concerning the, the trajectory would have placed Rouhani at 51%, which is exactly uh, the, 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 basically, the vote that he got. 
Um, we, we, we also ran, this is really important if you look at this, uh, this slide here. We, all, we would all, in all of our polls, we would say, okay, assume that this goes to round two, and so and so candidate end up in round two, who would you vote for? And basically, uh, Rouhani and Ghalibov were one of those uh, sets of candidates that would provide people. Going for, I mean, two weeks before the election, it's basically 20% saying Rouhani, 70% saying Ghalibov. And then look at what happens. I mean, you would really feel bad to be Ghalibov in this situation. Um, but basically, this is what happened. On the 13th, it was 48% saying uh, Rouhani and 47% saying Ghalibov. And you, if you do the trajectory on the 14th, you know, uh, Rouhani would you know, get more than uh, Ghalibov. So what are some of the reasons? Uh, and I'm going to show... Uh, the polling data that backs this, uh, these statements as well. Uh, one of the main issues that happened around the last uh, you know, four days before the election was one of them was RF's withdrawal in favor of Rouhani and endorsement of Rafsanjani and Khatami of Rouhani. This is not because RF, as you could see in these uh, polls, RF was down here. His numbers never went above. 7%. Uh, so it's not like him pulling out, uh, you know, gave Rouhani 20, 30, 80, I mean, 20, 30%. But what, what it signified was Rouhani's capability to strike coalition. The, you know, considering the election uh, situation, there was basically infighting on the other side. And this side was actually able to uh, bring about coalition, to bring about consensus. And someone actually pulls out the only reformist candidate pulls out in favor of another candidate, and that sends the signal that Rouhani is capable of striking those kind of deals. But I think even more importantly was the infighting among the principalists and their inability to form a coalition. If you would read news during, I mean, during those, those times, you would hear a lot of reasons why not to vote for Ghalibov. Why not to vote for Jalili? Why not to vote for, um, for uh, Rezai and Velayati? And basically, these candidates were producing these, uh, the reasons why not to vote for the other candidate, basically assuming that this is a, uh, this is a election among the conservatives, forgetting that there are actually another candidate on the other side. You would barely hear or read any uh, articles indicating why not to vote for Rouhani. So people getting, were getting all these reasons why not to vote for these people, but very little why not to vote for Rouhani. The public, the, the other four reasons I'm going to show you some polling data on. The public belief that this was going to go into the second round played a very important role. I mean, the role it played was that there were about 17% of the population voted strategically. And the way it works, it's, it might be somewhat difficult for this audience to grasp. I will explain it, though. Um, if you are, if in an in a, in a, in a election process that there is a second round, basically the way it works is that if a candidate does not get more than 50%, the top two candidates go to the second round. And it doesn't matter if you're the top two candidate with 16% of the vote or 45% of the vote. That doesn't matter. Uh, if you're under uh, 50, it goes to the second round. So the, the mind frame, the, the way the mentality worked was that if the candidate I like, I would look at it and see, is he going to be certain, is he certainly going to be one of the legs in the second round? If the answer is yes, then my choice voting for that person would be useless because he is going to be, you know, going into the second round and I could vote for him in the second round to become president. The next choice would be, okay, who is my second candidate? And uh, instead of voting for the first candidate, about 17% of the population voted for the second candidate, assuming that their first choice was going to end up in the second round anyway. So by voting for their second choice in the second round, they, whoever wins the second round, you know, they, they could feel uh, satisfied. And I, and, I show, and I will show you, uh, I mean, it has an, had an amazing effect. The two other issues, uh, the two um, other issues was 
if you had watched the third debate, uh, the Khalibov makes two really big mistakes. One of them, he makes a very ineffectual attack against Velayati. And when Velayati responds back, he doesn't you know, defend himself. He basically gets it and you know, stops it there. But most importantly, his, his ineffectual attack against Rouhani. He basically accuses Rouhani of um, not being in support of student movements. And he says that when I was the police chief, I was in support of these movements, but you were not. And basically, uh, uh, Rouhani gets back at him and said, the reason I would not support, I would not allow those protests is because I knew you were going to clamp down on them. So I didn't want them to get hurt and whatnot. That's why I would uh, oppose uh, many of these student protests. And basically, once that attack happens, that you, your intention was to clamp down on the students. You wanted them to come to the streets so that you could you know, have them all in the same place and crack down on them. When he accuses Khalibov of that, he basically doesn't respond and he lets go of it. In the public perception, what that did, that destroyed uh, Khalibov's, um, um, the, the honesty level that the public attributed to Khalibov. That his, uh, when, we, when we were gauging how on all candidates, we would ask, how honest do you think so-and-so is? After the third debate, Ghalibov's numbers on honesty uh, went all the way down. But I think the most important thing that, that happened, and I will show you in the slides, is Velayati's attack against Jalili in that third debate. So basically how it goes is that Rouhani and Jalili are basically debating on the uh, intricacies of uh, nuclear diplomacy. And Rouhani is basically saying there's a smart way of pursuing nuclear program, and there is basically a not so smart way. And they're basically going back and forth. Velayati comes up, and you, you guys know that Velayati is the chief counsel to the supreme leader on foreign affair matters. Velayati comes in support of Rouhani, not directly, but what he does, he says, Jalili is wrong. There were all these uh, instances where we could have reached a nuclear deal with the West, but because of our inability to negotiate effectively, we were not able to, to achieve them. And that changed public opinion on one main issue, and that was, is it possible to avoid sanctions without having have to suspend enrichment? Prior to this, and I'm going to show you the numbers, prior to this debate, the answer was no. There is no way we could avoid the sanctions if we want the nuclear program. So since we want the nuclear program, you know, we have to burden the sanctions. After the debate, that changed. The public opinion is that we could have it, we could avoid sanctions while having the program. And, uh, and that was the claim that uh, Rouhani was making. So on the issue of... Um, no one knew who was going to win, and everybody thought that this was going to go into the second round. When you ask people, who do you think eventually going to win the election? You know, people are all over the place. There is no consensus on who is the front runner. Uh, in fact, when you look at the numbers of Jalili, it's almost twice the number of his voters think that he is going to win the election. Um, and what that d does, this is, okay, so this is the panel. Uh, we asked people on June 13th if it was between Ghalibov and Rouhani, who would you vote for? And then June 17th, we came back and said, okay, who did you vote for? The people who voted for Rouhani, 24% of them on June 13th preferred Ghalibov over Rouhani. This is the dynamic that I was talking about. How does this happen? Well, the person thinks, the person who preferred Roh Khalibov over Rouhani, assumed that Khalibov is going to be going to the second round anyway. He doesn't need my vote. And it doesn't matter if he goes to the second round with 35% of the votes or 49% of the votes. It, that doesn't matter. So instead of voting for Khalibov, they voted for their second choice, Rouhani. So 24% of those who voted for Rouhani had, in fact, the day before the election said that in a, in, a, in a runoff, they would prefer Ghalibov over Rouhani. And it, what is important is that you, you, you see in this election that everyone said that we contributed to Rouhani's uh, victory, and all of them were right, because he won by such a you know, small margin. 
each and every single, you know, RF, if, he, if RF supporters would not have voted for Rouhani, probably he would not have won in the first round. If Ghalibov supporters would not have voted for Rouhani, uh, probably he would not have won in the fir first round. So all, all of these little aspects, all of them contributed to uh, Rouhani's election. But this was, I think, the most important issue because what it did, it exonerated Rouhani of the label of being a weak negotiator, a sellout, some even accused him of treason. This, uh, what Velayati did in that debate, basically saying that his way of negotiating was better than your way of negotiating, cleared out that mentality that was widespread among the public that Rouhani is a weak negotiator. He gave too much credit to the West, but got nothing in return. He suspended all of our programs, but then he got nothing in return. Velayati was able to dispel that uh, conception about Rouhani, which basically opened up the way for people to go after him. But most importantly was this issue. Before the election on May 10th, when you would ask the public which of these two is closer to reality, that Iran could avoid sanctions without having to suspend nuclear enrichment, or Iran could only avoid sanctions if it suspends nuclear enrichment. May 10th, 31% thought, only 31% thought that that was possible. After the election, so the, I mean after the debate, the debate happened I think on June 7th. Uh, after the debate, this number goes all the way up to 48%, and this number comes down to 36% basically opening up this um, perception that it is possible to negotiate a way out of the current uh, nuclear impasse. Who voted for Rouhani? This is, I mean, this is beautiful. When you look at the data, both uh, particularly after the th uh, third debate, you see that he has been able to attract 50% of all segment of Iranian population. There are, some, there, there are some exceptions. The Kurds and the Baluchs, the predominantly Sunni uh, uh, ethnicities in Iran, uh, disproportionately voted in favor of Rouhani. The Lors disproportionately voted in favor of Rezaei, uh, which hence, result, which hence uh, lowered uh, Rouhani's vote in that region. And those living in smaller cities and rural areas were slightly more likely, not less, were slightly more likely to vote in favor of Rouhani. But besides these exceptions, uh, votes for Rouhani were proportionate in all other ways. So he got 50% of the men, 50% of the women, 50% of the educated, 50% of the uneducated, 50% of the poor, 50% of the rich. And on all segments, and we'll see in the next slides, you would see the difference between the public and Rouhani voters are very slight, are not that significant. So why Rouhani? 89% uh, said that, the, first of all, the, those who voted for Rouhani give a wide variety of reasons, some of which are uh, often conflicting. But 89% of uh, them said that they picked Rouhani mainly for his own qualities. 6% said we voted for Rouhani mainly to prevent another candidate from winning. And when we asked which other candidate you wanted to prevent from winning, majority of them were naming Jalili, and 5% said both. And then we, from this 89%, we asked, okay, what was the uh, main reason? I mean, what, what was the quality uh, that uh, attracted you toward Rouhani? And the list is, is quite long. This is an open-ended question. But basically, people name a whole sort of things. The fact that they liked his program, his track record, uh, you know, that he is a centrist, whereas that he is a centrist, being a clergy is up here, and then the list continues. Uh, being a reformist, his ability to mitigate sanctions, uh, and you know, uh, having the endorsement of Rasunjani, having the endorsement of Khatami, and the list goes on. So what I want to emphasize by the list is that there is no one reason for which people voted for uh, Rouhani. And some of the things, analysis we hear on this side basically uh, making one reason quite bold, in particular the sanction reason, I don't see any evidence of that in the polling data that we have collected and others have collected. If you look at this, the, uh, so this is a cross stat between 
how painful you think the sanctions are and who, who did you vote for. So the people who say the sanctions have not had any negative effect on Iran's economy, 46% of them voted for Rouhani. And then those who say, oh, the sanctions are hurting really, really bad, it's destroying Iran's economy, the number is up, but only barely, even statistically significant. And politically, I don't think there's much difference between these two. So it's very slight effect. It's not uh, a very dominant effect. So why Rouhani? The domestic issues, if I want to wrap it up, is that the public, uh, the public as a whole be has become more pragmatic and more centrist, both in their approach and in demands. There is a public frustration, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to show some numbers on this, with factional gridlocks that, uh, you know, that occurred both during the time of Khatami and Ahmadinejad presidency. And Rouhani's effective uh, campaign to, first of all, say that I'm not a reformist and I'm not a conservative, I'm a moderate, I'm a centrist moderate, that I'm able to not only unite the country, but I historically have been able to work across the political divides to bring about consensus to solve the country's problem. And he's uh, familiar with the power dynamics in Iran. What both with Khatami and Ahmadinejad, one of the things they both suffer from was that they sometimes overestimated their power and sometimes underestimated their power. And that led to a whole sort of, um, and often some, political crisis inside the country. With Rouhani, he was very clear that I know where I stand. I'm well familiar with the power dynamics in Iran, so we are not going to suffer from uh, the mistakes of uh, Khatami and Ahmadinejad. But on foreign policy, there is a public desire for a more pragmatic foreign policy. And a change, this was, I think, critical, and only Velayati could have achieved this, a change, in public, a change in public belief that it is possible to avoid sanctions without having have to suspend the nuclear program and the enrichment. This change occurred as a result of, I mean, we have numbers before and after the, uh, the, the debate, and the only thing we can attribute it to is basically that debate and the statement of uh, Velayati in that debate. But also there was, a ch there was a change in attitude towards Rouhani's track record as Iran's chief negotiator. Before that debate, the mentality was, and the poll numbers uh, show this, that the belief was that Rouhani is not a very effective negotiator. He is too trusting of the West. He gives in too much and you know, expects very little in return, but uh, Basically, uh, Velayati corroborated Rouhani's claim that there's a smart way and there's an unintelligent way. And that what I did, this is very important, he emphasized that what I did, I suspended the aspects of the program, which we had already mastered, so that there wouldn't be much pressure on us, so that we can focus on the aspects that we had not mastered. And he, in, in fact, basically labeled himself as the, as the main person who made the current nuclear progress uh, possible. And, uh, you know, him saying it was one thing, you know, people are saying, obviously, what else is he going to say? But Velayati coming and basically endorsing that was another, was another thing. So what are the expectations of the public from Rouhani? The first thing is fixing the economy uh, and then uniting the country and avoiding factionalism to work within the system, and this has both ideological and pragmatic aspect to it. Ideologically, those who are in support of the Islamic Republic say, well, obviously he has to work within the system. But those who also have their differences, they say, not working within, within the system only brings about a gridlock which results in our problems not being solved. So that has both of those elements. To observe, you know, I mean, Iran is a religious society, and observing religious tenets is another one of those expectations. To, to make enhancing Iran's security his utmost. Uh, one of the things we, uh, we asked, uh, and I'm going to show one of, one of the slides, is that we put security along with other issues of importance, and we said, which one should he focus more on? And on all of them, even when it comes to civil liberties, the security uh, you know, gets the top number. To continue with the nu nuclear program, to mitigate sanctions, and to improve Iran's relations with other countries. So the numbers, 
When we asked them what is the single most important issue facing the country that Rouhani should try to fix immediately or should try to fix after taking office, you see all of the numbers. 31% say take care of the inflation. 21% uh, name various economic problems. 20% name uh, unemployment. 8% name the sanctions. Again, another economic issue. 4% uh, provide poverty, and another 4% say that he should uh, improve Iran's relation with other countries. So it is no wonder why his primary focus has become the economy since, has, since he has become elected. It is said that he holds daily um, uh, meetings with economists trying to figure out where Iran stands currently and how uh, these problems could be resolved. Now, uh, re remaining within the system was one of the expectations that I, that I enumerated, and it comes from this question. We ask, uh, which one of these two tracks should Rouhani adopt? Should he accept and remain in line with the grand policies of the establishment? This phrase in Persian is siyasat haye kalan nizam which basically says these are the policies that are set by, by a consensus, but most importantly, uh, by the supreme leader. Should he accept them or should he challenge them? Should he work within the system or should he you know, challenge the system? And basically what we see, 81% of the public and 78% of Rouhani voters say that he should remain and work uh, from within the system. Then the issue of religiosity, as I said, we asked to what degree do you think Rouhani should rely on religious tenets in his decisions? Again, I mean, and this is the number we have been getting uh, for all politicians. And this is, you know, religious tenets here might sound kind of weird, but this basically means for him to remain to be honest, for him not to cheat, for him not to lie, for him to be concerned with public, with the poor, and, uh, you know, those kind of things. And this is a security issue. We run this question, increasing Iran's security, with a wide variety of different things that the priorities that the president could have. So we asked which of these two courses of action uh, should, so before the election, should the next president, and then after the election, should Rouhani focus more on? And whatever you run security by, I mean, this got the highest number, enhancing civil liberties in Iran as compared to, you know, the 81 percent of uh, increasing Iran security. On the, on the economical issue, this is one of the changes we saw happening after the, I mean, the, in the course of the election, uh, between attracting more foreign investment into the country and making Iran more, more self-sufficient. The numbers of attracting more foreign investment went up by 10 percent, but still a large majority of Iranians and similarly large majority of Rouhani voters go with making Iran more self-sufficient. And this is more historic, and we can talk about it. You can ask, if you ask me questions during the uh, panel, I could explain more why this has become the case. Um, and then going to the nuclear issue, uh, you know, improving which uh, should uh, Rouhani focus on, improving relations with Western countries and continuing fully with the nuclear program, this is a high number, and the number has also, uh, I mean, uh, the, among the Rouhani voters, this is even more important, but still majorities, when they have to uh, pick between these two, the nuclear program uh, gets the uh, majority. Now, attitudes toward the nuclear program, and I, I'm running out of time, so I'll be somewhat fast. The numbers hasn't changed that much since, uh, you know, previous years and since polls conducted by other organizations. So the Iranians continue to believe that it is very important for Iran to have a civilian nuclear program. And while an increasing majority of Iranians think that the sanctions are hurting, and while they'll expect the sanctions to increase if Iran continues with the nuclear program, they would oppose any deal that would require them to suspend uh, or to forego nuclear enrichment. So. These are the numbers. If, as you can see, and these are different organizations that have run, done polls in Iran uh, since 2006. The numbers is basically about 90% of the public either very think it is very important or somewhat important for Iran to have a civilian uh, nuclear program. On the sanctions, the numbers are going up. More and more people are saying that the sanctions are really having a negative effect 
on Iran's economy. I mean, from this was in October, 35 percent. In June, this is 48 percent. So this number is continuously rising. And people think, majorities, about 70 percent, think that the sanctions probably will increase as well if we continue with the program. But when, after asking these two questions, so we say, are the sanctions hurting? They say yes. We say, okay, do you expect them to increase if you don't stop the program? They say yes. And then we provide them with this deal. Uh, I call it the American deal, but it's, it's far away from that. Is that, uh, would you favor or oppose an agreement whereby all current sanctions against Iran would be removed and Iran would continue its nuclear energy program except that it would agree not to enrich. So we are making it sound as if this is a small thing. This is, you know, you give up a, uh, you're giving up a small thing in return for, uh, you know, all of the sanctions being removed. And we have been asking this question since 2009. Is Steve uh, was the first, uh, you know, it's, it's, it was the first person to ask this question. And the numbers, you know, majority of people oppose it. Yes, uh, Rouhani, uh, there's a, Rouhani uh, voters uh, are slightly more likely than the public to favor this deal, but only slightly. But look at it on this side. They're also slightly more likely to oppose it, which means that the number of DKs, the number of people who are saying we don't know, among Rouhani voters are slightly lower than the rest of, of the public. And this is the same finding that Gallup had. So this is our founding. And Gallup asked the same question uh, uh, a couple of, uh, I think, five, five months ago, that given the scale of sanctions on Iran, do you think Iran should continue to develop its nuclear program capabilities or not? And to the Gallup poll as well, 63% uh, said that we should continue the program despite the, uh, despite the sanctions. So what is, it, what is that doing? Uh, one of the effects of the sanctions then and I've said this uh, many times, is that as you look at this number, the favorability of U.S., the imposer of the sanctions, the country that is imposing the sanctions for a program that the people are approving of, this is a key difference. You know, in sanction literature, sanctions often work if you sanction a country for reasons that the public also support. So if the, with the apartheid, the public was, you know, against the apartheid system, sanctioning that country kind of helped the public voice their opposition. Well, there are different ways of looking at it, but that's basically the, uh, one of the main arguments. But in this case, you're sanctioning a country for a program that it's public support. So as the Gallup poll also showed uh, in, that, uh, in its uh, 2013 poll, uh, when you ask Iranians who do you blame for the sanctions, the Iranian government gets 10 percent. U.S. get like 48 percent. U.N. is 17 percent. So majority of people are blaming it on the outside. And that obviously has an impact on their view uh, about the United States. With that, I end the presentation. Thanks, Ibrahim. That was really fascinating. Um, I, um, before I turn to the discussants, I'm just going to ask you a couple of uh, questions, and some of them principally informational. Uh, the first one is, if you could tell us a little bit more about uh, more details about the polling and the panel that you've done uh, between May and, and late June. Sort of, I know you said between 700 and and 2,000 people, and then there was one panel after the elections. It would be helpful to give a flavor about the, the sampling and, mm -hmm. and you know, the, uh, how many polls you actually conducted in that sure. period. Sure. It's basically 13 cross-sectional polls uh, uh, before and after the election, 12 of them before election, one of them after the election uh, on June, uh, about 10 days after the election. Um, the the polls were done basically on a daily basis. One of the things we had learned from the previous election is that since in Iran, you, due to the election law, what happens in U.S. in a span of two years, we are compressing it in 20 days. The cycles in a public opinion 
changes rapidly. So if you conduct a poll a week before the election, its predictive power is, is going to be very limited. All it can tell you is basically which direction the public is moving, but what's going to happen at the end of the day, uh, that's not going to predict. So these were basically, we were running them on a daily basis. Um, and the sample varied uh, from uh, the minimum was 709, which uh, gives you a margin of error of about 3.7%. And when we had more time, like the June, uh, June uh, 23rd um, poll, we would run larger samples uh, with, 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 so that we could do more analysis of them. Uh, so we would run uh, with a sample si size of uh, 2,000. Um, this was a pilot project uh, in a sense that we wanted to show uh, again, uh, and it's a long story because we went through the same thing back in 2009 with that election. Uh, we wanted to show that actually polling does work in Iran and that uh, it should be utilized uh, more vigorously by those who are involved in policymaking and as well as academics. One of the main problems uh, within the university among the scholars there is that they complain about a lack of Iranian data. So a lot of the analysis they have to do, they use foreign data. And then they use that to you know, talk about things inside Iran and that really doesn't make sense. So with this center, what we are trying to do is first of all, to prove the credibility, uh, the, the fact that Iran just like China, just like India, just like other countries, you can poll in it and the polls uh, are actually meaningful and that you should actually, instead of focusing more on qualitative uh, uh, research, which has become predominantly the way research is done in social science, you know, that there should be a shift to more quantitative uh, types of research as well. Well, thanks. Um, I, I want to. I have two substantive questions about the the data, and then I'll turn it to to Steve as the first discussant. Um, one is your interpretation of the rapid uh, rise of Rouhani's numbers. I mean, that's really quite amazing if you look at it in terms of you know just it, it really hours. You know, even the last right. day, you go from twenty five to thirty eight percent, and so it's it's an incredible ascent that was surprising to many. So the the question, I think, is, you know, how do you interpret that? One interpretation is what you br provided, which is particularly with, with regard to Golubov's um, uh, voters, people who said they were going to vote for him, but, you know, voted for Rouhani as a second choice because. Um, I wonder if, in fact, there may not be an opposite dynamic of that that you, you're not capturing, which is uh, that, that in, in some ways it may have been the case that people just thought Rouhani couldn't win. And the more they thought he could win, the more just they accelerated the support. And, and that seems to maybe coincide with the assessment about Jalili, because Jalili, uh, a lot of people thought he was going to win. A lot more people thought he was going to win than he received in terms of numbers. Mm -hmm. So as you get closer and you get results of saying, wow, he's getting more and more and more, then you might have an accelerated rallying for him. So he may have been a first choice, not a second choice for a lot of people, mm -hmm. but didn't think that he could win early. As soon as they realized he could, they just jumped on his bandwagon. What, 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 why, why is that not the more likely interpretation? Of I would happened? say it's not the more likely interpretation because the general public opinion was that this was going to go into the second round. And if it's going to go to the second round, again, it doesn't matter if he goes to the second round with 20% with of the vote or 49% of the votes. And the fact that he got a bare majority points to that, uh, that you know, it, it, could have well, it could have well gone to the second round because, uh, what was it, the two th uh, 250,000? That's, that's by how much he won. I mean, if he had 250,000 less votes, so that's about... Uh, four votes per ballot box, uh, not much, uh, it would have gone to the second round. Uh, but I think more importantly is that when you look at the number of people who say that he is going to win, and when you look at the number of people who say the other candidates are going to win, they're basically around the same range. It's like 20% saying that uh, Jalili is going to win, 20% saying that Rouhani is going to win. 20% saying we don't know. If you, if in one of the slides I show, all of them are centered around one point. So it wasn't like people were saying Rouhani is hopeless. 
because as they were talking to others in the town, they would see that people, different people are voting for different person. One of the significant things that we, we hear people say when we ask them, uh, you know, when did you, one of the questions we ask is that when did you decide to vote for Rouhani? About 20% of his vote was, uh, was attracted to him on the day of the election. So, uh, you know, when we asked in the, in, the, in the panel when this was an actual question, when, was, when did you actually decide to vote for Rouhani? 20% say on the day of the election. And we, when we asked them how did that happen, one of the things that people often said was that in the ballot, you know, as they were waiting in line to vote, they were ambivalent between Qalibov and Rouhani or another candidate and Rouhani. And as they would ask others, who are you going to vote for, they would see that Rouhani has more of a support than these other candidates individually. So if you ask, for example, seven people who are you going to vote for, three of them would say that they're going to vote for Rouhani, and all other candidates, only one person would say they're going to, that they are going to vote for uh, you know, the other candidates. And this, as they were saying behind the phone, that, that this made them that perhaps you know, I'll vote for the winner. So voting for the winner dynamic was also in effect on the day of the election. Well, a final, a final question is about your, your assessment of the, a, um, the sanctions issue. Mm -hmm. Um, because uh, if particularly your uh, polling after the election indicates that uh, most of the Iranian people really are focused on the economy. Right. That's what the, it's not really so much right. the international. Right. Uh, a good number w still want to improvement with the international, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, with the international community, but, but that's not the, the, the right. first order of business. Right. Um, and you suggested in your polling as well that people understand that sanctions are hurting the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, people expect that there will be even more sanctions, therefore more hurt in the economy. Uh, and people are prepared to live with that if that's the cost of maintaining enrichment because they're not prepared to give up enrichment. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if I'm sitting in Washington and I'm trying to interpret that data, uh, I would say, okay, I understand it, but in the end, I'm looking at a president who needs to perform well on the economy. And whether or not his public sees it, uh, what I do on sanctions is going to affect the economy. Mm -hmm. So I, am, I have the lever to determine whether he's going to succeed or fail, and that's my lever with him, regardless of what the public opinion wants. That is, if the public opinion doesn't see this connection, I see it, and therefore I can use it as a lever uh, to influence his behavior? Mm -hmm. Well, there, there are a couple of things to be said on that. One of them is that Rouhani would see that as well. And if he sees that he's stuck between a hard place, a rock and a hard place, he will go to the public and say, look, I tried, as Ahmadinejad has done many times, that it is the sanctions that is doing this to the economy. You guys don't want me to back down on it. There's not, can, nothing I can do on that front. All that I can do is to basically uh, help the domestic economy with whatever tools I have available. In fact, that turns into a scapegoat for Rouhani to blame uh, his, if he, he, he is ineffective on, in fixing the economy, to just blame it on the sanctions. It's not something that Rouhani would actually fear much. But <coughs> particularly, again, is because the Sanctions are being placed for an issue that the public feels so strongly about. It's an issue of national sovereignty and national pride. And to tell the public that do you want bread or do you want honor, you know, the choice is often clear in the Middle East, at least in, in what they present. I don't know in reality what happens at the end of the day. But if you put them between these two choices, the choices often are pride, or dignity, or sovereignty, as opposed to uh, our economy. And another thing is that another uh, historical experience is the Iran-Iraq war. I mean, that war dev uh, brought, uh, I, I was reading a report that Iran's GDP basically got half of what it was at the end of the war as, as compared to what it was uh, in the early days of the war. But that did not result in people saying that we should surrender. You know, when it comes to that, those issues, I think that there are tough choices to make, and people often go with the national sovereignty and pride 
um, Thanks. choice. Um, so let me turn uh, to our discussions. I, I will ask, um, we'll go with Steve first and then follow with Twitter. And, and please uh, try to limit your remarks to about 10% so we can, uh, to 10 minutes so that we can have uh, about, uh, I, I talk in percentages, you know, <laughs> the, the polling <laughs> thing. Um, uh, the, uh, we can, so we can have uh, uh, 20 minutes for uh, public uh, intervention. So Steve, please. Okay. Um, naturally, whenever somebody hears about polls from Iran, they may ask the question, you know, could these possibly be valid? Is it possible to do polls there and so on? And we've been looking at uh, data from the University of Tehran for, um, the, for the last election as well as uh, the current election. And last time we uh, conducted a call-in poll from the outside and compared the results, uh, our results from the, uh, to the results. In, uh, and from the University of Tehran, and, and they were quite consistent, even getting down to low levels of granularity. Uh, it, it's also important to note that there was a poll done by some organization, not very well known, called IPOS, that did tracking polls, calling in, they say, from, from the United States, and their numbers, um, uh, they did six uh, polls, and, and their numbers track quite closely also with the University of Tehran polls. Um, now, the, the um, there is of course this extraordinary change that happened, and you just don't really see this kind of thing um, in most <laughs> polls. There's this, this sudden swing toward toward one candidate. It is important to note, of course, that that their election time is is, is very short, a matter of weeks, unlike ours, which are increasingly becoming four years. Um, um, but uh, so that's a very important to remember that this is this, a very intense time of public deliberation that occurs in in Iran, and um, issues are are are, are very are, are are very foreground and be debated in a very intense way. Now, from sitting on, on over here, the question is always, you know, does this signify? Uh, some change uh, relative to, 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 to the regime? Is this a, some kind of challenge to the regime? Uh, there were uh, uh, commentators that were saying in, in advance, if Rouhani wins, it will be a mortal blow to the, to the regime and so on. And um, I, I think that the evidence is quite clearly that, 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 that this is not, uh, that it is a, a move more toward a centrist position. He is a centrist. He's sort of an, a, 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 a consensus candidate more than he is a a, um, on one side of uh, some uh, polarized equation. Um, now, um, he is not a, by any means a challenge to the Islamist principles of the regime. Um, he's not strictly a modernist. Galibaf would be more of a, more of a modernist. Um, so, and, and the, the polling that all suggests that they don't uh, expect him to in any, any way depart from, uh, from the Islamic principles. However, there is a movement, the, the, the numbers do suggest that it's a movement away from what Ahmadinejad represents. Uh, and and um, one of the key things is, is, well, what then, what, do, what really does Rouhani um, uh, represent in that sense? And as uh, was mentioned, the economics was very foreground um, in, in, in people's thinking. And there is a movement, uh, and Rouhani was quite critical of Ahmadinejad's policies, particularly in regard to uh, the heavy emphasis on subsidies and um, um, pulling more toward a more liberal approach, a more efficient uh, approach to the economy. And there was considerable deliberation on that issue as well. And there were movements on that issue away Oh, oh, dur oh, during the, the during this period, away from uh, uh, endorsement of the of the subsidy um, emphasis that uh, Ahmadinejad had toward a more um, efficient uh, uh, liberal approach to to the to the economy, um, but. Equally important, though, though the economy was, was really foreground, still the question is what were the critical changes um, that happened over the course of the uh, election? And, and the relation to the West and the relation to the nuclear program was, all, was also prominent, and you saw some really dramatic changes there, as Ahmadinejad pointed out. What did Rouhani represent going in? He represented this, uh, this uh, uh, person who had been a negotiator, who had taken, who had act, tried very hard to negotiate with the West, who had made some accommodation, who had stopped enrichment and so on. Uh, so he represented not, not um, going along with the West's position, but supporting 
the idea that negotiation was possible. Um, and, and there was a narrative around him that he had done this and it hadn't worked out, uh, that he had been weak, that he had been taken advantage of. And that narrative was retold. That was recreated. That was, well, it didn't work out when Velayati in, uh, uh, um, uh, in the debate, uh, in a sense, redeemed him. And uh, Velayati, who is, is, is uh, quite conservative, said, no, he, 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 was, it was not, uh, he did not make mis uh, this. This was not fundamentally a mistake. The, the Jalili made mistakes and so on. That, that, and, and also, this has to be put in the context of what, uh, who Ahmadinejad was, that he was very confrontational. And uh, so the question is, is there a way to, in some way, deal with the sanctions, to mitigate the sanctions without abandoning um, uh, enrichment? And so this was a kind of shift in the, in the, in, in the public deliberation toward maybe it's possible, and Rouhani's the kind of guy to, to do that. And so the, the redemption of his, of, of his narrative was, was, in a sense, a move, a, a representative move toward a greater openness to that, uh, um, to that, uh, um, to, to the possibility of negotiation. Um, the, it, it is important to remember th that there are questions that, that have been asked showing that the public will support uh, um, some greater intrusiveness uh, uh, for inspections, uh, limitations on the level of, of enrichment and so on as part of, of making a deal with the West. The pr possibility of, of stopping enrichment entirely is, 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 is uh, rejected, but there is support as, you know, as much as two-thirds for some kind of deal. Uh, so that's always in the back there of the mind. Uh, and is it, is it possible, the, the debate then is, is it possible to really have a deal, to, ha to have negotiations? And this, um, so Rouhani's election does signify some movement toward an openness and an interest in the, in, in the possibility of negotiation. Um, let me first start off by saying how fascinating I think this poll is and what it reminds us of, which is that even for those of us who try our best to follow Iran as closely as we can from this very long distance, a job that has become increasingly difficult, mindful of the fact that during the past eight years, even simple interaction, travel to Iran had become much more difficult, which ultimately um, is a decision made by the Iranian government that clearly also uh, worked against their own interests because the less people understand them, uh, the more they miscalculate or project intentions onto them. But I think this poll shows how little we really know about the Iranian electorate, how little we know about their calculations, etc. Um, and I, I find it fascinating and extremely informative. At the same time, uh, it raises significant question marks. Um, some of the things may be a bit difficult to, to grasp at first, but um, I think one of the big, big favors that this poll has done is to show what the calculation of a voter is, of an informed voter is, in a system that has essentially combined the general and the primary elections, and at the same time has a two-tier system, which means that strategic voting is a possibility in a way that rarely happens in the United States. Um, and, and I think here in Washington, we, we've completely missed that. And I think that adds a completely different complexity and nuance to the analysis that is needed on how to interpret and understand uh, what happened in Iran. Um, but there's a, there's a couple of things I would like to ask you about, um, Ebrahim, that uh, I'm very curious about. I think in your presentation, my, one almost gets the impression that Rouhani was some sort of an accidental winner in this election. Uh, clearly, the, the margins were pretty small, uh, and a lot changed in the last uh, days, if not in the last hours. But piggybacking on what uh, Shibley also pointed out, I'm wondering if we may not be giving him uh, a little bit too little credit. Because at the end of the day, this was part of a deliberate strategy that his campaign had. They had a strategy of not surging, in fact, not even creating too much enthusiasm amongst the electorate too early, because if they created it too early, they knew exactly what would happen. The bickering amongst the conservatives would end and they would start looking seriously at the threat of a reformist of a, or a centrist candidate. Instead, they kept a relatively low profile and then they went out really, really hard 
in the last three to four days of the elections. And that's when the videos of Khatami and I think Rafsanjani as well coming out really encouraging people, the endorsement, um, the, the withdrawal from RF, etc. This was a deliberate strategy. It worked quite well. The, the, they knew that the only way to win was to win by surprise. If they had soared in the polls too early, the bickering amongst the conservative would have come to an end and a different strategy. And the miscalculation that the conservatives did would not have happened. And as a result, the, the calculation that people started to come to Rouhani's side at the end, because suddenly they saw that there was a chance for him winning, exactly as uh, Shibley pointed out. Um, and, and again, the data may show something differently, but perhaps there are other questions that need to be asked as well. I still would think is a factor that should not be underestimated, uh, because at the end of the day, even though the margin was low, one has to give credit that they actually run a pretty clever campaign. They had a clever strategy, and they had understood. They even set it out. I mean, Rouhani said himself, this will not be 2009. Uh, and they were very much aware of what happened then and, and how to uh, play the game in such a way that that would be avoided. So I would like you to comment on that. But before we go there, I would like to ask a couple of questions uh, in addition to that. Um, the first question is, and I think you touched upon it a little bit, um, the question of doing polls in Iran is, for some reason, um, a question here in this town, and, and there's a tremendous amount of skepticism, some of it perhaps warranted, uh, some of it seems to be a bit unique, as if Iran is a completely different universe and there simply polls cannot work. Um, all the different types of tools of triangulation and things like that that you can do, you can do polls uh, to measure in fact, asking uh, businesses in South American countries about exactly how much criminal activity they're involved in, and you actually can get a pretty uh, uh, accurate uh, response to that, but apparently you can't do polls in Iran asking people who are they going to vote for, because some way, somehow that is very different. In this town, analysis based on absolutely no facts at times get more attention and seen as more validity than actually scientific polls. If you could give an explanation, an answer perhaps, why is it that, what are the different measures that are taken to make sure that polls in Iran actually are not particularly different from polls in other countries and why they are, why they should be viewed as reliable? I would appreciate that. And the last question is a bit of a more, uh, of a political nature. I think you pointed out correctly, almost everyone can take credit for Rouhani's victory in the sense that the margin was so low that votes from this candidate or that candidate could have made a difference. Now, what does that mean for the political strength and ability for Rouhani to deliver? Does it make him a strong unifying president who essentially is responsible to everyone and everyone feels that they have a stake in him? Or that, does that make him a paralyzed president that cannot actually move at all because everyone wants a piece of him? We'd like to hear your predictions as well if there is any data that shows uh, or any of the behavior that he's shown so far that would give us an indication of that. Thank you. So I'm going to go with the last question first. Uh, the fact that the expectations from Rouhani are so, I mean, th there, there's such a wide variety of expectations, as well as reasons for which people voted for Rouhani. This makes it actually quite difficult for him to deliver, uh, because which, whosever expectation he satisfies, there is going to be someone's expectations that he is not going to be able to satisfy. However, one of the issues where all people are basically united on that this needs to be solved is the economy. That's an expectation which, you know, from the very, very, you know, conservative all the way to the radical liberals, all of them, this is an expectation that all of them have from Rouhani. And I think he is going to make this issue the unifying issue that he would bring about consensus among various factions and political parties to work on. He would basically say that for the sake of the economy, let's put our differences aside and let's uh, look at this in a more pragmatic way. I think that's um, uh, one of the issues. But also uh, what it does is that it forces him to be a very centrist president. I would not expect Rouhani's cabinet to include controversial figures. I would not expect Rouhani to adopt any controversial stances on most issues of importance. 
Uh, and that also means that I do not expect him to take any bold measures as well. He is going to be very centrist. Uh, he, uh, unless, unless he wants to build, a, you know, a voting base for him for himself, and he wants to say, okay, yeah, you guys voted for me, but I actually need a power base to work on, so I'm going to start focusing on this. Sounds a bit like Obama. <laughs> a bit like him, right? You know how um, that ended up, right? <laughs> <laughs> not too well, um, but but it could. But there there is an issue. Uh, that at times of crisis, Iranians, uh, we have seen during the past times, that there is a tendency, and this is not only with Iranians, this is the same case uh, wherever you look at, there, it creates a tendency for people to say, okay, we need to put some of our differences aside and fix this, you know, this uh, very important issue. So that also, I think, uh, would come to his help. Regarding, you know, how did Rouhani win the last minute? One of the numbers which I did not show up here uh, for the sake of time, we would collect two other data uh, on all of the candidates. One of them was how much do you like this, this guy? So the favorability rankings of each of the candidates. The other one is that if he, come, if he becomes a president, how effective of a president do you think he will be? Okay. Rouhani's numbers on favorability, and this is very important, May 10th was always, people who very, very much liked him was 5%, okay? Not that the rest really hated him, the rest didn't know him much. They, they had no opinion of him. In fact, a majority of people May 10th did not have much of an opinion about Rouhani, and those who knew Rouhani tend to have this kind of a negative, uh, you know, would view him with a slight suspicion that this guy, you know, did he engage in, uh, some even accuse him of treason, that he was, you know, a sellout, basically. Uh, so when you look at those numbers, and that number now is 60%. All the way from five percent that, May that's 10th. after the election. After the election. What about did you measure that in, on June and during uh, just the, before the exactly. election? Exactly. During the election, what we see is that this number is coming up, but it's not reaching a majority of people who are very favorable of him. And his numbers, the the, the individuals who uh, people very much liked, uh, I mean, his numbers were quite similar to the other people. And, and the reason I picked the very much the very favorable number is because what we have experienced in Iran, and this is going to the, to the third question, is that there are some you know, intricacies of polling in Iran. And then, then the results you get, you have to analyze it in a specific way. One of them is that when you give a four-point question, very favorable, somewhat favorable, somewhat unfavorable, very unfavorable, uh, when it comes to issues that deal with, uh, with matters that there is a social desirability, there is a right answer, the top button, we take it that this is a full support. The somewhat favorable is more like a politeness. Yeah, somewhat favorable. Okay, it's not a full support. It's not a somewhat favorable answer. And then those people who say somewhat unfavorable or very unfavorable, you could combine those two and say these people have unfavorable views. So basically, if we collapse a four point into a three one, the top somewhat favorable and then the bottom two. This is usually how we look at it. And when you look at Rouhani, his number is not very different from that of Qalibov. In fact, what is interesting that Qalibov is well known from early on in the poll. And there is a lot of favorable feeling toward him. And, and you know, what a lot of the conservatives were saying that, were claiming that Qalibov is not a good candidate for conservative. The reason was that he had support from all sides. In fact, his biggest support came from Tehran. And if you look at the poll results right now uh, from Tehran, you see that Tehran is one of those cities where Rouhani actually gets a lower percentage of people voting for him. And Qalibov has a higher percentage as compared to the rest of the country. One more point on why poll works. I, you know, as a social scientist, I have no other, you know, instrument in my hand. If I want to talk about the public, you know, it's either census data or it's survey data. Other than that, there is no other reliable 
way of talking about the public. Now, it could be that the uh, polls from Iran might be less or more reliable, but it's basically the best option that is available. I sometimes get baffled when people both here and in Iran talk, give themselves the right to talk about the public and what the public thinks. And when you would ask them, okay, where are you, I mean, <laughs> what is that based on? They have nothing to present. If you don't have survey data, if you don't have census data, I don't think you should give yourself the right, anyone, to say that the Iranian public is this, or the American public is this. You need to have, the, as a social scientist, I've been trained to question such generalizations about the public. Uh, but when we compare our polling data to both the census data, to election results, two uh, uh, issues on which we have hard data on, we see that there is a very close association between the numbers that we are collecting and the numbers for which there is hard data for. And that gives us confidence that this method, just like in South America, just like in China, just like in everywhere else, this method is the, you know, is the most reliable method to gauge public opinion in Iran and for that matter, anywhere else in the world. Well, thanks so much. Uh, I, I would like to open it for uh, uh, questions at the moment, and uh, we have about uh, 15 minutes. Uh, let's start here, and then I'll go to Fatima. Please. Thank you. Uh, and please identify yeah, yourself I'm when you. Uh, Nicholas Berry. Nicholas Berry of uh, Foreign Policy Forum. <clears throat> Very good, terrific presentation. My question has two premises. Uh, the first one is on that economic slide. You had. Inflation first, and I think uh, sanctions were third. Um, sanctions was fifth. I fifth, think, yeah. well down. I propose that they're highly correlated. The inflation comes from too few goods chasing too much money. Uh, the sanctions of both financial and trade would provide more goods and therefore affect inflation. The second is that uh, it's quite clear at least to me and a lot of others, that the United States government is willing to uh, accept enrichment for both energy and medicine <coughs> uh, in, re in return for the intrusive inspections about the nuclear weapon uh, program. Um, and also to have a radical and uh, hefty reduction in sanctions as part of that agreement. My question is, what impediments are there preventing the United States from making an offer the Iranians can't refuse? Sure. That's a very good question. And uh, you know that has been the question that is being asked in Tehran more than it is being asked on this side. Because in Tehran, if you read um, uh, Dr. Rouhani's article in the Time magazine back in 2006. It's a must read. I mean, that's where he is going to start from. Anyone who hasn't read it, I recommend uh, you guys reading it. Basically, in that article, he says that we are willing to provide any sort of a safeguard and inspection related uh, uh, you know, compromise with the West. Anything they want, we're willing to give it on our side. What we expect from them is a recognition of our right to enrich. I think this recognition is the key issue that is preventing us from offering them something that they cannot refuse. If, you, if we provide, and this has been one of the, and uh, I think Trita can talk more about this. Uh, this has been one of the issues that has uh, uh, prevented all of these negotiations from actually achieving uh, the end goal. The Iranians come to before anything, we need you guys to come up and say, we recognize your right to enrich uranium. That is not something that we have been willing to provide the Iranians. We have not been willing to even uh, utter it as a possibility even. Uh, I mean, that has been in, in the discourses. And I think that's what is preventing uh, a negotiation uh, from action. I think if we give them that, if we come to terms with ourselves that they do have a right to enrichment, there are millions of different ways that we can, uh, you know, work out a deal 
that would be both respectful of Iranian rights and it would also mitigate our concern that there would be a diversion of uh, nuclear activity toward uh, weapons activity. I, I should just say one thing. Obviously, this is not the panel on the nuclear issue per se because it's about Iranian public opinion. But uh, one of the things that obviously isn't quite present here, and obviously I know there are other data on it, is um, there was never, of course, a question about do you, feel, do you think the government is really seeking to develop nuclear weapons? What happens is the Iranian public is absolutely supportive of the right to enrichment and of a peaceful nuclear right. program. And they assume that their program is a peaceful program. At least that's what we assume. Now, what happens if we were to ask that question directly? Do you believe that your government is clandestinely trying to acquire nuclear weapons? Or would you support, if you ask them directly about whether they support the country acquiring nuclear weapons? Of course, they, they, you know, probably not. I know I don't remember if there's any polls, and maybe Steve would know uh, from the past. But uh, obviously, the, the government says it's not developing nuclear weapons. But the, the issue here pertaining to uh, what I'm pointing out, I'm not really trying to get answers specifically on this, but that this particular question is, is just not going to be answered by the data. It's a whole debate, and we don't have people representing the international community or the U.S. government on this issue for, for a debate. But I just wanted to put that on the, uh, as a backgrounder. Um, Professor Keshavars has a question behind. Hi, thank you. Uh, this was a wonderful presentation and, and panel. Um, I, I think the point that I very much agree with the point that Shebley made that probably the voters began to believe that Rouhani could do better and they you know came to came forward with that. But for those of us who are not pollsters but are following events and headlines, one thing that is missing from this discussion is a rather large elephant in the room is civil liberties. Rouhani, from the beginning, presented himself as a defender of civil liberties. In fact, from the very beginning, when he spoke in Jamaran, the problem was that his supporters did things that one worried the security. And the attack of Ghalibov on him about the students was concerning that, too. That you, if you are a defender of civil liberties, why did you not allow, w allow the students to demonstrate for which he had a good answer? So. Um, and the point that was, did not come up also was that actually there was a serious debate of a second disqualification of Rouhani, which was reflected in the major media in Iran, and RF did not step down until that threat was eliminated, and the Shorai Nagahban, the council, announced that there, will not go in, there was not going to be a second process of qualification. So in fact, I think that he did um, play on that serious public demand for civil liberty quite effectively, but that seems to be very much missing from the polls. That makes me wonder if asking that kind of a question on the phone could be something, just as the nuclear issue could be something that the people would not feel completely secure to answer. Very quickly, we did ask a lot of questions on the civil liberties, and the public is overwhelmingly in support of more democracy. Uh, uh, well, when it comes to their evaluation of the current situation, there is a divide of whether, you know, people say we want democracy, and a lot, a big chunk of population say that we do have democracy as well. But there is also Another segment of the population who say we need uh, improvements in those fields. But the economic situation has so overtaken the, the dynamics in Iran, has become a primary concern of people from the whole, I mean, uh, the, both you know, in, from northern Tehran to Khash of Sistan, Baluchistan. That is something that they're dealing with on a daily basis. Uh, on, on a daily basis, civil liberty is not is not that kind of a concern. Is not a concern in that level. And one of the things that I showed, I compared uh, when you put people between, for example, security and civil liberties. 
uh, you know, security takes over in that sense, uh, in, in that realm. I know Steve doesn't like those uh, that kind of uh, question, but what we were doing uh, with with the security matter, we were comparing with everything. We were saying security and economics, security got it. Security and civil liberties, security got it. Why? Because they're looking at, you know, the region around them, and they're saying when there is no security, there is nothing. So we, we, we won't have a democracy if you don't have security. We won't have civil liberties if you don't have security. We, and the threats from the United States actually amplifies that. It doesn't mitigate that. So there is a move, and that provides room for the government, that provides room for those people who may want to limit civil liberties to pull up the security card and say you're under security threat. And so the more threat we project uh, into Iran, the more we talk about war, the more we talk about more sanctions, you know, crippling sanctions and whatnot, there is a tendency for uh, you know, a more securitized uh, environment. In the interest of time, I'd like to take three questions together and then ask everybody to comment to make the last comments. So um, I have one, uh, two, and three. Uh, so why don't we start right there? Yeah, um, William Reed from the uh, Dunkirk International. To follow up on the last question, uh, Ibrahim, uh, how did you uh, check for uh, social desirability bias and fear of the government? And, uh, and sort of a subset of that is what did the people you call think, who, who did they think was asking the question, who was paying for it, did, were they really confident of anonymity? Uh, yes, uh, over there, yeah. Uh, no, the back behind, behind, right there. Uh, Karthik Vaidyanathan, Department of State. I was wondering, the panels have touched on this already, but I was wondering if you directly asked in your polls, have you seen in other polls, uh, is a nuclear weapon important? Do you think your government has the capacity to create one now or in the near future? And relatedly on the concessions, even though you've asked about total enrichment, have you asked about, you know, are you willing to accept a lesser amount of enrichment from 5% to 2% or something like that? Um, uh, concessions on the uh, inspections. If you've seen that in your polls or other polls, if you could comment on that, that would be great. And the final question right there. Greg Tillman, uh, Arms Control Association. My question relates a little bit to the last one. I thought Stephen uh, Cole said something very important at the end of his presentation about polls indicate that two-thirds of the Iranians would accept uh, greater transparency and uh, further uh, and some kind of limits on enrichment, as long as there is the right of enrichment. And so I guess my question to Ibrahim Mosseini is, do, do you agree with that? And to what extent it does transparency or limits on enrichment uh, get interpreted as a dishonorable outcome? And does Rouhani have running room there to deal with that kind of proposal, which to me is inevitable if there's any kind of vi viable P5 plus one offer, it's of course going to grant a right to enrichment. Mm -hmm. It's going to be around what kind of limits on and what kind of transparency. Uh, I apologize to the rest. I know there were other questions. I think the speaker may be here right after, and please feel free to come and ask the question because we'd like to end on time. So uh, I will give uh, uh, not only uh, our speaker the opportunity to respond, but also uh, Stephen uh, and Trita to say final words uh, and please make the, make the responses brief. Okay, so on the anonymity issue, um, first of all, when we would call, we would save your calling from University of Tehran. And the number from which you call, if they would call back, it would be, you know, that institution. So that provides them with that uh, ease of mind. But what is important is that when you listen in on these interviews, because these are telephone uh, interviews, you can listen in on them. You don't get a sense that they're censoring. They, you don't get a sense that they are fearing something. Why? Because when they would, most people, when they would give a response, they provide their justification for the response that they just given. It's not like they say A, B, you know, response option D. They say, no, I'm going to do this because this and I think that. And then at the end, they would ask you, what do you think? You know, it's a discussion. 
Uh, it's not like a, it's not like a, you know, a hard survey that they have to pick responses. And the way they talk and the way they interact, it you know, it gives you the sense that they are, you know, they are being honest, they are giving their honest opinion. Obviously, if the questions become too sensitive, there might be a different story. But on the questions we were asking, we did not get a sense that they were feeling uh, that it was being too sensitive. We actually ran a uh, project, this is uh, fascinating, on this issue. And what we realized is that if you, so we, it was basically on a, on a if you tell them, the closer you get to the government, so when you tell them that we are calling from Ministry of Interior or we are calling from uh, you know, a, an institution which is close to the government, they don't become less critical. They become more critical. They push the top button. They say the economy is, you know, is, is going down the hell. You know? we, we have this problem here. We have that problem there. And what is happening in that situation, they want the government to come and fix the problem. So they're pushing the top button in hopes that somebody actually hears them. On the other hand, when you, you know, say you're from an academic institution, the answer is become more moderate and more centrist, trying, you know, gearing toward the politeness factor and, and those issues. On the nuclear weapons, we, we have, uh, uh, back in October 2012, I came here and presented data on this issue. What we are seeing is that as we are increasing the pressure, the, uh, the, the percentage of people who want nuclear weapons is also going up. Uh, in fact, when you do the uh, correlations, the people who fear most that there is going to be an attack on Iran, those are the people who are most likely to want Iran to develop nuclear weapons in hopes that that would prevent that attack from occurring. It's not the other way around. Uh, but still, it's in the minorities. We haven't run that question on nuclear weapons uh, this time around. But if the 2012, October 2012 data, if we assume them to be accurate, uh, the, the, the desire for nuclear weapons, there is, a, you know, there is a strong minority, I would say. I think it's around 35% uh, who would want Iran to have uh, nuclear weapons. They do, a majority, about 67%, think that if Iran decides to build a nuclear weapon, it can, that it does have the, techno the capability to build a nuclear weapon, but they don't think their government is doing it. Okay, so uh, on your point, the majority of people don't think their government is doing it, but on the inspections, uh, what we see is uh, uh, the, the polling, the number, the latest polling, the numbers that I've seen, and they're not very recent, by the way, uh, suggests that they are open. Uh, the public is open to a wide variety of inspections and safeguard agreements. Uh, whether it's going to be perceived as being respectful of their, you know, of their identity and of, 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 their, of their nationality depends on whether it is part of an international system or we are picking out Iran and saying you specifically permanently have to do these steps. They are willing to, they are probably willing to accept, accept them temporarily uh, as a measure of, uh, you know, uh, creating more trust and, and more confidence. But permanently, it has to be a part of an international system where other countries are also a member of, of that agreement and um, the, of, of those uh, safeguard regimes. Well, thanks so much. Uh, any final thoughts, Steve? Just, just quickly on the question of um, the public's attitudes about basically the NPT regime, Non-Proliferation Treaty. They support that, um, th that regime. They support that treaty. And they want to be in good standing. And they get very, very intense about we, we, we have the right. We have the right when they, when they emphasize that and they want that to be affirmed. That's within the con context of the NPT Treaty and in the context of international law. So that, and, and they, they want to be in good standing in it, and they, and, and they see that it is in some way being used against them. Um, there, uh, so I, I do think there is very strong, all, all the, the polling that we've done suggests that the, the numbers that want to bas basically break out of it and have nu nuclear weapons and so on are, are, are quite, quite small. So we do have this uh, uh, potential and, the, and the, the, these, are, these uh, proposals that have been put forward by Tom Pickering and Bill Lures uh, 
um, uh, and Walsh, so all, all, those, those uh, are, are viable. There are some sticking points that Ibrahim pointed to that still need to be negotiated out about um, are these intrusive inspections going to be, uh, exist uh, permanently and, uh, are, um, and Iran insists that it shouldn't have any kind of special status, and, but it does have a special status vis-a-vis -vis the IAEA and the UN Security Council, and so there are the, the, these, the, these problems. I don't know that, that this is something that it, um, is, is in play in, 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 in the Iranian public, but it, can't, it probably could be. Uh, Rouhani could be portrayed as somehow uh, humiliating the, the Iranian people, irrespective of their, of their, of their ultimate goals of the, uh, of the negotiation. So it's a delicate dance, and how we play it um, is, is, is really key. I think that this really is a, 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 a real moment of opportunity, and that there's a, there, there's a readiness, and we should, should be, you know, uh, step lightly as, as, as we go along here and not, not try to upset the, this, uh, this, this possibility. Thanks. Trita. Two quick points. First, on the question of the polling, I'm not a pollster, I'm not an expert, but I just wanted to convey something that I heard from another person who does polls in Iran. He pointed out that the response rate when they do polls in the U.S. tends to be somewhere around 14 percent for average Americans. Um, and then when you go to actually some of the Middle Eastern communities here in the United States, it's actually lower. The response rate in Iran, according to this person, was around 74 percent. Which is comparable to the Arab world. Yeah, which is um, interesting. If, if fear was a huge factor, then you would probably guess that the, the response rate would have been much lower rather than so much higher. Um, and similar to what Ibrahim said, this was not at all um, um, just you know A, B, or C. Instead, people were very keen to share their views because perhaps they view this as one legitimate and relatively secure way of being able to vent because they are very dissatisfied. And this is something that they do then. And this, I think, should be factored in when we are having the conversation as to whether polls in Iran are reliable or not. On the other issue that I thought was very interesting, uh, Ebrahim, you pointed a lot of emphasis on it, that um, Velayati, in one of those debates, in some ways exonerated uh, Rouhani by pointing out that there is a way to be able to proceed with a nuclear program without paying this very high cost that had come uh, during the Ahmadinejad years, which then was transferred as to be blamed on um, Jalili. It's a very critical question because it also shows that there was a break in the narrative in Iran, uh, a break uh, in the narrative in the sense that there is a belief that perhaps there is a different way. The, the West is not automatically just going to pile up more sanctions regardless of what Iran does. A very strongly held view that had existed. I personally think that it's still probably there to a certain extent, but there was a, a, a pause from it. Perhaps it can be a break from it. But for it to be a break, um, it requires a lot to happen on this side as well. And just today or tomorrow, there will be a new vote in Congress for new sanctions to be imposed in Iran, which will be the first U.S. government response to the Iranian elections. And I wonder, will there be a break in that narrative if the first thing we do from our end as a result of so many million people going out there and voting for the most moderate candidate that we actually pile on more sanctions? Well, thank you very much. Uh, please join me in uh, thanking our uh, panelists for a very wonderful conversation. <laughs>